Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending the Street Transportation Department's virtual public meeting about North 32nd Street between Shea Boulevard and Choya Street. It's a very exciting project that originated from community input. So we're very happy to be here tonight. We will be recording this presentation, so if you and your friends and neighbors were not able to attend, barring any unforeseen circumstances, in a few days you will find this um, presentation loaded up to the project website. We are delivering this presentation in English with a Spanish interpreter, and I'd like to welcome Mr. Mario Barajas, our interpreter, so he can introduce himself and tell any callers who are on the line who would like to listen in Spanish how to do so. So just one moment. And Mario, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you fine. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mario Barajas. I will be uh, uh, introducing myself uh, to the Spanish speakers that uh, may be uh, listening in, and I will be giving instructions as Heather had previously mentioned. Buenas tardes a, no a todos. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas. Voy a estar sirviéndoles como el intérprete del español. Bienvenidos a la junta del día de hoy. Quisiéramos darles uh, unas instrucciones breves si es que va a requerir un intérprete del español. Si gustan anotar como aparecen ahí en sus pantallas las instrucciones de cómo conectarse a la línea telefónica para escuchar la interpretación en español. Pueden marcar desde sus teléfonos al número de teléfono 602, es el área, 534-1000. Luego se les va a pedir un código, ese, ese código viene siendo el número 63519 y luego van a oprimir el signo de número, o sea, pound. Así es como van a poder escuchar la reunión por teléfono. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you, Mario. My name is Heather Murphy, and I would like to introduce our panel of speakers today. Um, it is... Um, a large panel because we have a, a bunch of disciplines represented today, but I'd like to go ahead and introduce our, our panelists. And when I call your first name, if you'd please introduce yourself and um, the department or program that you represent. Keeney? Good evening, everyone. My name is Keeney Knudsen. I'm with the City of Phoenix Street Transportation Department. I'm the Director of Street Transportation. Good evening, my name is Brianna Velas and I'm the Assistant Street Transportation Director and I oversee the division responsible for delivering our capital improvement project. Hi, good, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Locke. I'm the Deputy Street Transportation Director over our Programming and Project Delivery Group, uh, the group responsible for this project. I look forward to our presentation tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Leticia Vargas. I'm a special projects administrator in the programming and project delivery division, and I'm a member of the project team. Welcome. John. Good evening, everybody. My name is John Dixon. I'm with the street transportation department, and I am the project manager for this project. And Aaron. Good evening, everyone. I'm Aaron Allen. I'm a principal landscape architect at J2 Design and the uh, design consultant for the city. So at the end, uh, or I, I'm sorry, um, for those of you who um, may not be that familiar with using WebEx as a meeting delivery tool, I'll give you a, a short little tutorial. Um, there is a chat box that we will be using to monitor um, questions and answers throughout the meeting. Um, to open the chat box, you'll find the little speech bubble, which is the fourth button on the bottom of your WebEx control. These should appear on the bottom uh, portion of your screen or on the right if you're viewing with a mobile device. You should also see a participants tab 
um, and a raised hand, a raise hand option. Um, if you're using a mobile device, you can raise or lower your hand by pressing star three. Uh, so we'll plan to call on the public after the presentation is complete. Um, we'll move to questions and answers, and we do have uh, a special request for Councilwoman Stark to speak, so we'll call on her as well um, after we get finished with our presentation. Um, so we can uh, respect everybody's time and our speaker's time. We'll ask you when we get to the Q&A portion um, to please limit your remarks for one to two minutes um, so we can get through all the questions or comments. So with that, Keeney, I'd like to open it up to you for some opening remarks. Thank you, Heather. Again, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, this is an important project for our department. Um, it's an important project, I know, for Councilwoman Stark and members of the community. Uh, we found out about this project a few years ago, um, and we've been working on it, uh, but also been coordinating with a lot of other projects, um, including a water services project, water line project going on right now as well. And uh, this is really an opportunity to, this evening um, to be able to listen to the community, um, to hear a little bit about what, what, we're, what we have planned for the project, but also to hear um, what the community is envisioning for this project as well, to get your feedback, to get your comments, uh, to really make the project a better project at the end of the day. Um, it's one of the, and I would also like just to thank everybody for being um, with us in the virtual space uh, with this current public health situation. It's, it, it doesn't allow, allow us to do what we normally did was be in person and be um, talking to you face to face and going over materials and talking about that. So I really wanna thank everybody for making the time to be able to be here wherever you're joining us from. Um, I know my team has a great presentation ahead for you to talk a little bit more about this project, but we're excited about it. We know how to, um, we know this section of 32nd Street um, had a lot of uh, capacity because of um, the SR-51 going in. It, it used to operate a lot differently um, in the previously. And uh, so with the current use and the development that's coming along there, we really want to have the opportunity to be able to leverage that development and to make a better um, and safer section of, of 32nd Street. So I want to thank you again for being here, but I'll, I've said enough, so I'll let it turn over to my team. But uh, again, we appreciate you being here. So with that, Aaron, um, we'll let you take it away. You and John. Good evening, everybody. Again, my name is John Dixon, and on behalf of the project team, uh, welcome to our virtual 32nd Street Shea Boulevard Detroit Street meeting. Uh, I'm going to go over the agenda very briefly, uh, kind of what the goals of the project are, and I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to uh, Aaron to run through what uh, we encounter as, as the current conditions out there as we see them today. And then the meat of the program will be uh, allowing Aaron to pr present uh, some concepts and opportunities that might present themselves to being implemented uh, down the road to help uh, beautify landscape and otherwise improve safety along this corridor. Finally, uh, and, and I don't mean to slight anybody by saying that was the meat of the project when the next step may be even more so because the, the whole point of this uh, project is to not only understand where we're going, but when we get to the end, uh, hopefully, all of you will be able to uh, participate and bring your ideas because everything that we present is not the entire list of uh, options that could be out there and be had. So we're here to listen to what you want. I would emphasize that uh, not only do you have a chance to raise your hand and perhaps participate, ask us some questions here live, but even more importantly, uh, sometime down the road, you'll be able to go back to our website and uh, participate by taking a survey and giving us our your written comments, um, which might even be more important than what you might have to say, uh, although we, we, we welcome everything you have to say, but in order to get an accurate uh, feel for what you're uh, thinking about, uh, we do appreciate you writing it down and participating through that. Uh, you'll hear more about that survey and the webpage later on. Next slide, please. So as the director has indicated, this project has been brought about by the community. This is uh, this is not something that uh, the staff has, 
is uh, cooked up. Uh, we've heard from many of you out there that the 32nd Street uh, deserves its, its some attention to bring it up to speed to make it uh, more ap appealing to the, the residents of the neighborhood. Some of the things that we're here to talk about are are very conceptual in nature. Please please understand that the at the moment we currently don't have any funding for design or construction. However, uh, as the uh, the director would uh, say, we are committed to this project and we will find we will find a way to get this done. Uh, but the first step in understanding what needs to be done is to to present some ideas to you folks and then listen to what you think you would like to see happen to the corridor. Well, a few of the things I'd like to point out is that the director alluded to, there's currently two lanes of traffic in each direction out there. Um, and although we've, there's been a freeway built, uh, State Route 51 has been built parallel to 32nd Street. Um, 32nd Street does main, uh, continue to be a uh, bypass route should any, um, incidents occur on State Route 51 that would cause us to have to shut down the freeway. So we will not be trying to reduce any of the traffic capacity and we'll be trying to maintain those two lanes northbound and southbound. Some of the other ideas that we'll be presenting to you will be including what maybe we could do to uh, enhance pedestrian safety by maybe widening sidewalks, um, adding, um, modifying the existing bike lanes to add buffers, landscaping elements to provide shade, um, and other streetscape ideas, maybe even uh, medians in the street to provide another opportunity for uh, landscaping and shade trees in the middle. And uh, finally, the one last point I, was, I wanted to make, um, we're, I'm sure you're well aware that there's a, a very large uh, water pipeline being uh, constructed up 32nd Street. Uh, matter of fact, construction has started. It's a two phase project. Um, phase one starts from the south near the Dreamy Drop Park and will uh, commence moving northward. And it will uh, end its terminus is just about 200 feet south of the intersection at 32nd Street in Shea. Whereas phase two of the project will be coming um, southbound from Bell Road and it will be meeting the phase one, like I said, about 200 feet south of the intersection on uh, 32nd Street, just south of uh, Shea Boulevard. The uh, water pipeline project is scheduled to be complete uh, in December of 2022, and therefore uh, we would not anticipate any sort of construction for this beautification and uh, enhance, safety enhancement project until sometime shortly thereafter, uh, depending of course on the funding source and timeline that we get programmed for the uh, project. With that, I'd like to start, uh, turn the program over to our consultant, Aaron. Uh, he's going to talk about the current conditions and future opportunities. Aaron. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. So uh, this existing corridor, uh, we kind of broke it up into what we're calling two different districts where there is a, a commercial district closer to Shea and then about at Desert Cove where we transition into what we're calling the residential district. So out there, there's definitely some constraints um, that you know, we need to be aware of and cognizant of as we're looking at concepts and what can be implemented in the corridor. Um, one of those, Big constraints is that there are overhead power lines that run along the entire west side of the street. Um, there are existing bus stops along the corridor that we need to be cognizant of. And there's also a lot of existing uh, commercial businesses that have access along the corridor. So here's just some, some of those pictures of the existing conditions where you can see the overhead power lines, um, the bus stops, existing driveways, um, and you know, even some areas where you could have some potential landscape opportunities. 
So moving then into the residential district, again, we have those overhead power lines on the west side of the street. Um, on the east side of the street, we have a new condition, uh, both on the west and east side of the street, of frontage roads, where uh, residents come off and, and access their, their uh, cul-de-sacs or through streets or also just directly to their driveways. Um, we also have introductions of the little orange line. That's where there's existing service alleys. So here again, just some site photos showing what those conditions look like. The overhead power lines with adjacent um, privacy walls next to the sidewalks, those service alleys, again, existing bus stops. Um, the view showing uh, a frontage road on the east side of the street, a frontage road that's on the west side of the street, and just how some of the residents access directly off some of those frontage roads. So concept one um, kind of looks at, here's some of the, the things that it looks at. It looks at adding landscape medians where space permits. Um, it looked at some enhanced bike lane striping um, and it looked to landscape and irrigate the existing median that is along um, the east side of the street from East Desert Cove to Choya in that residential district. And then it's also looking at potentially adding planting um, where space allows along the edges of right of way. Um, looking obviously for any conflicts with uh, above and below ground utilities. And then it also thinks of that, um, you know, looks at potentially implementing some sort of a public tree planting concept on some of the private uh, parcels to help add shade and trees um, in the business district. So here is uh, a view starting at Shea, a plan view, where you can see that um, the, the two lanes of traffic are being maintained, but the bike lane is as having some safety enhancements done to it, where we've added some of the, the green striping at those conflict zones of the driveways and turn bays. Um, you have medians that have been added uh, into the center, still trying to maintain access where we can to existing driveways. You can see here that we have some Boxes, these light boxes here are that's where a power pole is. And those are required setup and clear zones where no vertical obstructions can be planted um, in order for the power company to maintain their overhead power lines. So here you can see some of the lighter green circles. And this is would be a proposed um, for a tree planting plan with, with a public private relationship to where the city could provide a tree. And then the owner of that property ends up taking on the responsibility for maintaining that tree. This is the middle of the corridor where we kind of begin to transition from the uh, business commercial district to the residential. You can see um, there was an area here on the east side of the street next to the self storage unit that there is additional space within the right of way where. Um, additional landscaping could be um, added. Uh, a median can be added in several locations through here. And then you can start to see along the frontage road, the existing median that separates the frontage road from 32nd Street. Um, we have the ability to re-landscape and add some additional plant material in that location. Again, also adding the enhanced bike lanes within those conflict zones where you might have uh, cars turning and moving I'm just making them aware that this is the bike lane is there and you could see bicyclists. So here, this is just a perspective view of the street view of kind of looking at, um, you know, about the middle of the transition area. This would be in front of the, the storage unit where we could end up adding some more additional landscape um, where we could add in a raised median in the center. On the west side of the street, you can see the overhead power. These red boxes, again, are those setup areas and clear zones from the power poles where the, the utility company needs to be able to access those lines. And then in the street, you can see here where we actually have uh, utilities that are in the street. So green represents that there's a sewer line. The blue circles 
are some of the water lines. Those are going to have restrictions for uh, basically in the very dark gray where we can't plant any new trees. Kind of in this lighter gray area, trees can be planted, but we would have to implement a root barrier. A root barrier just helps to protect those utilities from invasive tree roots. And then in the lightest gray area, that's where there's no uh, planting restrictions. So this is the uh, same kind of street view um, looking at where the frontage road is. So again, we have those existing privacy walls and overhead power on the west side of the street. We are able to implement some center raised medians in certain locations. The enhanced uh, bike lane striping to notify drivers of potential conflict with bikes for that turning movement. The frontage road remains as is, but the existing island that separates the 32nd Street from the frontage road could be relandscaped. And this is the last kind of plan view of the residential showing just what we were showing that you know, relandscaping that existing uh, buffer island from the frontage, adding in some center raised medians, the enhancement of the bike striping. And then the frontage road on the on the west side, actually part of that frontage road was converted and taken away and then converted to uh, a potential landscape area as all these three adjacent residences um, get their access off of that smaller area of frontage road, not all the way needed up to Choya. So concept two, concept two through the commercial district is exactly the same as in concept one. Um, the big difference between concept one and two is that in concept two in the residential, instead of having the frontage road remain as is, some of that frontage road uh, gets converted to a uh, multi-use pathway like wider sidewalks and then additional landscape area. So here, concept two, again, the commercial area, some raised medians where they can be implemented, that public-private partnership with the tree planting program and those enhanced uh, bike lanes. The transition area uh, between the commercial and the residential corridor, again, the same here, south of, of Desert Cove, we're utilizing some of that additional, that excess right-of-way to add additional uh, plant material, streetscape to enhance shade. And then here, once we get to Desert Cove, part of the frontage road would end up going away and having a nice wide sidewalk implemented with additional plant material. Um, off of Mescal, there's no, um, there's no direct uh, resident access from this frontage road to any of the residents on the east side of 32nd Street in this area. So again, this is just a view looking north on the street where this is again, where that um, self storage unit is. So the same exact layout as concept one, but here concept two differs in that that frontage road has been converted to additional landscape area and wider pedestrian pathways and sidewalks. So this is the very last segment of the residential area. So again, removing the frontage road between Shangri-La and Yucca. Um, this frontage road north of Yucca is, needs to be maintained because there are residences here that have direct access to their homes from that frontage road. But then same treatment on the west side of 32nd where that frontage road was reduced, still maintaining these residences access, but where there's not access, converting that um, to a landscaped area. So this is just kind of a quick comparison of a side-by-side -side showing some of the, the differences. So, you know, both concepts added landscape medians where applicable in the commercial district. Um, the sidewalks in the commercial district were not changed on either concept. And then both concepts add 
additional landscape improvements in front of the self storage unit. So concept one, concept two, you can see that through the commercial district, they are exactly the same. The residential district, so again, north of Desert Cove. So we added, both concepts have medians where available. Um, the sidewalks in concept one were not changed. The concept, concept two has a shared use pathway added. The landscape improvements, um, are much greaterly enhanced in concept two on the east side because of the removal of the frontage roads. So again, just a side-by-side -side comparison, looking in the residential district of concept one versus concept two, and the differences of having the frontage road left in place versus having the frontage road converted to wider sidewalks and potential um, landscape enhancements. And with that, I'll turn it back over to John to kind of talk about some of the next steps. Thank you for that rundown, Aaron. That was awesome. Um, this is just a simple graphic uh, kind of uh, explaining the, the entire process in a nutshell that we're going through. As you can see in the um, burgundy colored block, uh, we are in the planning study uh, phase of this project. Uh, as I've said before, we're, we're at a point where we have uh, no preconceived notions of, of how this is going to turn out. Uh, we've, we've explained some uh, possible improvements that you, you would consider on a project like this, but, uh, at, but tonight we're here to see and hear what the residents of the area might have as far as ideas for other improvements. Down the road, as you can tell, the, the color of money is green. Uh, we will be out actively looking for uh, funding for design and construction. Uh, those are two separate components, uh, so they have two separate uh, line items for uh, their purpose. Well, one for design and one for construction. As I've said in the past, uh, once we've designed the project and uh, found money for construction, uh, the, the orange box would indicate that prior to any more improvements, we would uh, clear out any conflicts due to uh, right of way issues or utilities that may have to be moved in order to accommodate our, uh, our new construction, which is, uh, with, such as moving uh, telephone pedet telephone pedestal boxes or maybe even uh, some of the uh, smaller uh, holes in, in that are in the way. Obviously, I don't think the, uh, the large power lines are going to go away. Finally, uh, the blue box, it represents construction. And as I've said before, given that the water project will not be uh, complete, until December of 2022, we do not anticipate uh, any kind of construction happening before then. So you would not see, the soonest we would see anything uh, would be sometime probably in the spring of 2023. Next slide, please. So uh, I believe Heather is going to uh, give you some more direction on this, um, but the bottom line is we, we will have a survey uh, soliciting your input. Um, please, please get the word out. Uh, as you've done such a, a wonderful job, we see we have quite a number of people participating tonight. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Um, my final thought and uh, all of that is that we are here to listen. Um, the whole point of this project is to try to make a improvement uh, safety and beautification to the 32nd Street corridor uh, between Shea and Choya such that it would be so successful that potentially we could apply that as a, a template down the road to further going north, farther north of the 32nd Street corridor. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes my remarks. I will turn this back over to our moderator, Heather. 
Thank you so much, John. I was busy uh, taking care of the chat box a second ago, so I, I missed a beat, but we do have a special guest here. Uh, Councilwoman Deborah Stark um, has asked to say a few words. Um, and Councilwoman Stark, you may go ahead. Thank you very much. I wanna thank everyone for attending. This truly is a special neighborhood and this project is neighborhood driven. I think this project will not only beautify 32nd Street in the Shea area, but will enhance public safety. And public safety is of critical importance to me. Many of you know Phoenix is in the top 10 of cities experiencing pedestrian fatalities. We need to change that fact and projects like this can make the difference. I've already talked to the mayor about getting this funded and she's fully committed to this project as I am. I'm very excited to see that we have, I think, over 70 people in attendance tonight. And that gives me a lot of hope that you guys are going to help us get it over the finish line. So thank you again for attending and thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. Um, we appreciate your remarks and we're capturing everything um, as we go along here. And at one point, I think we had 100 and, 109 guests online. Um, so I know one guest did have some technical difficulties that we were unable to help them troubleshoot. But again, like I said at the outset, we will be posting a recording of this meeting tonight, including the public comment. So um, please stay tuned um, and thank you uh, for participating. Um, I'm going to take a second now and look for a gentleman that pre-registered to speak to see if he's among the attendees and I do not see him, but I do see um, one of the other people that pre-registered to speak and I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Allison Barnett, um, just a moment. You'll be able to speak. And then after that, I will call on Brian Houston. So, Ms. Barnett. Hi, good evening. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Um, we are delighted to see that uh, we are going to be enhancing the public safety um, as Councilwoman Stark shared. Um, it's been, there's been so many fatalities or very dangerous accidents. And quite frankly, in Tempe and some um, some other areas, um, traffic slowing measures have enhanced the community because uh, people slow down and are able to enjoy um, the amenities that we have. Um, so I would encourage um, you know, our community to check out some other areas around Phoenix where some of this has already been done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think um, it would be interesting to see um, what other things we could incorporate maybe you know, streetcars down the road or something like that, because um, it just, it would really be nice to be able to enhance the multimodal transportation around our neighborhood to continue to um, support um, both the public safety as well as just the access. Um, you know, I think um, we have so many different socioeconomic levels around our neighborhood that um, just making it easy to get around is important. So. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, again, we're really excited to see what happens. Thank you, Ms. Barnett. I'd let, I'm now going to unmute um, Brian Houston. Yes, Brian, yes, please go can ahead. You, hi, can you hear me okay? I'm on an iPad. We can hear you fine. Okay. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you. And uh, Aaron, I love your ideas for the landscaping. Uh, we are presented with a very unique situation here because Choya is one of the very few non-primary overpasses over any major any, any major freeway in Phoenix. It's not it's not Shea, it's not Cactus, and to my knowledge, I know don't know of any other like it in all of Maricopa County. Uh, it was actually created as a result of the freeway ending when uh, uh, before the 51 was completed north of Shea. So it's a unique area. Uh, we live on Choya. We jokingly call it Choya International Raceway because of the speeds that are obtained by people as they come over the overpass on the 51 and continue down Choya. Likewise, I think most of our neighbors, 100 other people that are on here will also agree that the speeds obtained on 32nd Street as they approach Choya, as, or even Shea, 
are excessive. There's, there's no traffic calming. There's little to no uh, police supervision or oversight. So we have four young kids. We live on the east side of 32nd Street, who, because we're within the non-busing area of both the middle school and the high school, will have to cross 32nd Street every day. My question to you all is, are there or has there been discussions of traffic calming and traffic slowing on 32nd Street as it approaches, on Choya Street as it approaches 32nd Street and 32nd Street as it approaches Shea to get people to slow down? And if not, can we incorporate traffic calming techniques into this design? Because it's a beautiful design. But I've got four young kids, age 11, 9, and 27 year olds that have to cross 32nd Street every day to go to school. 11, she's in third grade, so this is coming up by the time this project will be completed. Can we take a look at that when we're talking about safety? Can we talk about the intersection at 32nd and uh, Choya as well? That's my question, and I appreciate everything else you guys have done. Thank you. I'll do that. Mr. Houston, thank you for your comments. Uh, we will, as the project team is uh, compiling all of these uh, ideas from the, the public, uh, we will certainly consider uh, at least giving that a look and understand that your concerns are the, sp the speeding vehicles on Choya Avenue along with uh, pedestrians young and old having to cross uh, 32nd Street at, at Choya uh, to attend their, their school. So uh, we will put that on our to-do list to uh, to run it through the machine, so to speak, and uh, we will uh, let you know down the road how that works out. Thank you, John. Um, we had a question from the chat box that I'd like to ask, um, having to do with the commercial area uh, regarding how this design will affect ingress and egress for businesses in the commercial area. After you answer that question, I will call on Ismael Morales. Uh, with regard to the access to the businesses, yes, I, I understand that uh, it probably feels like there is unlimited access to uh, 32nd Street and probably Shea Boulevard as well for the businesses. And um, we will be, uh, utilizing our expertise in our traffic services the division to help us uh, vet out the most efficient way to help uh, locate, if necessary, uh, medians to uh, direct access in a more efficient manner, uh, particularly with uh, respect to making sure site distance and uh, pedestrian safety is incorporated. But we will uh, definitely be looking at uh, seeing the most efficient way to manage access without uh, hindering uh, the appearance that we're trying to cut somebody off. But uh, thank you for that uh, comment. And I'd like to call on Ismael Morales. And after Ismael, um, Mario Barajas, I will call on you to see if we have any questions on the Spanish language line. Mr. Morales? Hi, uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me speak. Uh, first of all, a great presentation uh, from you guys. Uh, I actually live uh, in the Shea neighborhood. I live in the apartment complex right off of Shea and 32nd Street. Um, so it's very important to me. And I know a councilwoman starts. So I also sit on the um, Arts and Culture Commission. I'm a commissioner there, but I'm speaking as a resident. But I talked to uh, Councilwoman Stark and she shared with me this uh, project and I'm so happy that this project is going forward. Um, I think um, in terms of, since this is a capital improvements project, I hope to see uh, some uh, public art uh, installed on the median um, or something like that. I think it, uh, it also um, is a public safety thing. I think if we put some public art, especially on bus stops, uh, that'll be great. Um, but the landscaping is wonderful. I think the, the landscape we need, um, it's, it's a great thing that we need to put, especially with the trees that, uh, city council has talked about when it comes to, uh, planting trees in a city. I think that's something great, uh, to beautify 32nd street. 
Another thing I can, just came up to mind, and I know the gentleman um, before me uh, spoke in terms of, uh, you know, school children. I know there's a lot of, there's an elementary, a middle, and a high school um, right nearby. It's like a complex of three schools. And I'm just hoping that you, if, uh, if there's plans to put uh, crosswalks on 32nd Street between Choya and Shea, I guess that can facilitate uh, the crossing, the crossing for children, and also putting a speed limit, actually like a lower speed limit as well. I know that 32nd Street is a concern when it comes to street racing. You know, you hear it, you know, up and down the street. That's something to consider. But the crosswalks, I think putting crosswalks, I've seen them all around Phoenix where they put like the, 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 light, the street light, you know, they push the light and then, um, you know, there's a signal. I think that's something to consider, especially when there's uh, people in the community that live on 32nd Street just before Choya and the residential portion. So, but anyways, I mean, other than that, um, I just hope that there's opportunities for public art. Um, and so that's something I hope that uh, it, get, it gets included in those plans. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you for your comments, um, Anna. Just as a reminder, so we can get to everyone, we'd appreciate it if you could keep your remarks to under uh, two minutes. Um, and uh, does anyone from the project team want to comment on uh, Mr. Morales' question regarding a hawk signal or a pedestrian signal? Um, we did have a chat box question asking for a crosswalk between Shea and Shoya as well. I guess if no one else is going to say anything, I'll say something. <laughs> um, I, I, I always abhorred the, the silence there. So um, regarding the hot crossings and the pedestrian crossings, I think, you know, as we get closer into the design phase of this project, there'll be opportunities to be able to look at pedestrian movement, movements and activities um, across 32nd Street along this entire stretch from, you know, from Shea up to Choya. And I think as you see some of the development that's happening along this corridor, I think that will help drive and, and kind of modify some of the pedestrian movements that happen there. So we want to make sure we're, if we do something like that, we put it in the right location to be able to encourage safe pedestrian moving movements and crossings across the, the, the roadway. So that's something we will evaluate through the design phase and may be included in the construction of the project uh, ultimately um, as we um, you know, get further along in the process. Thank you, Keeney. Um, now I'm going to unmute Mario Barajas, and after Mario, we will talk to Brian Snyder and then take some questions from the chat box. Mario, please go ahead. Yes, Heather, uh, thank you. Uh, I had just inquired on the Spanish line and there is nobody that is uh, wanting to speak. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate it. So that means, Brian, you are up and I'm unmuting you now. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first, great presentation. I'd uh, love to see the, the the motivation from the neighborhood and the response from the city. Uh, I know John answered it a bit, but I just want to echo the, the community's need for some access management on the north and south legs of 32nd Street. As a lot of developments coming in, there's a lot of left turn movements on both legs. And there's a lot of confusion with motorists on making the left turn southbound and northbound on both of those legs. And it's created a lot of conflict between motorists in those opposite directions. I uh, just want to echo the need for it. Um, I know you're going to have expertise look at the most efficient way to, uh, to look at that, but just want to echo the community's need for that. And secondly, um, I know this is a 32nd Street project, but on the on the west leg of Shea Boulevard, the bike lane ends about 300 to 400 feet before 32nd Street. It looks like there's opportunity to to bring that bike lane all the way up to 32nd Street. And just as a resident of the neighborhood, we ride our bike to get coffee uh, at Press Coffee almost every weekend. It would just be nice to have that bike lane not end um, before the before the intersection. Um, and that that's it. Thank you again for the presentation and the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Brian. Um, we had a comment from a gentleman who had to leave the meeting, but he's, his question or comment is why uh, we don't run these improvements all the way south to Cheryl 
and I believe there was a later comment that said that um, they petitioned the city to have uh, the project begin at Cheryl or further south. Um, Kenny or John, do you want to take that question? I, I'll probably take that because I've been involved in the, since the initial discussions about this project with, with uh, some of the community members and, and Councilwoman Stark. I think, you know, the first thing we needed, you know, as, as um, John pointed out, you know, and we've, we mentioned, the budget isn't there yet. And I think that's more of that's more of a matter of timing of, you know, because we've got to work around the water project and some of the other things that are going on. But I think also um, is knowing what the scale and, and scope of the project is in comparison to what the community's expectations are. I want to make sure that we have a, a project that we have enough funding to be able to build. And I don't, and I, and I was getting ready to chat, you know, something back to, um, you know, one of the, the uh, meeting attendees about that, that a, a, this potentially could be, um, you know, a two phase project or something like that in the future. We want to make sure that first we were addressing some of the concerns from Shea um, northward um, to Choya. And then if we have, you know, as we see something and, and, and this is successful, maybe it is something we can look at uh, south of uh, 32nd Street. I'm sorry, the south of Shea going on 32nd Street there. So I don't think we're opposed to it. I think what we want to make sure is first we hear what the community wants and then and, and see what that what that will actually cost to be able to deliver what the community's expectations are on, on the, the Shea to Choya piece. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you, Keeney. We do have another person who's raised their hand. I'd like to call on Natalie Carrick, and then we'll go back to the chat box. Natalie. Thank you, Heather, and thank you to the panel members for the presentation. I found it very, um, very informative, and I would also want to just agree with what Brian had mentioned about the access management and ask the panel if there has been any um, evaluation of the crash history in the corridor that you're studying to see where we might have better opportunities for implementing the raised median to restrict access to some of these um, driveways, specifically near the Walgreens and the new Starbucks going in on the corner of Shea and 32nd. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Natalie. Kenny, I'll, I'll take a shot at this. As part of our normal design process, uh, one of the one of the items that we're always looking at is uh, traffic data, accident data, um, and, and uh, in, in this case, we'll probably be looking at uh, pedestrian usage of uh, uh, bus and bus ridership. So, uh, yes, our our traffic services division does keep track of. Uh, the accidents that are reported through uh, the police department and part of our analysis in order to justify and or recommend uh, access uh, to and from 32nd Street will include an analysis of uh, accidents and where they occur and what type of accidents they are because uh, the type of accident that happens uh, sometimes dictates the type of uh, recommendation needed to uh, for improvements to help mitigate those uh, future type of accidents. So we will certainly be looking at traffic data um, and looking at the uh, accident data as well to try to help make our decisions on where best to place uh, physical barriers in the streets such as medians in order to facilitate uh, movements and access. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, great job, John. I think I was just gonna add on to that as well. That one of the concerns that we have, you know, when we're looking at median projects is is private property rights. And so that's the, the delicate balance when we look at potentially medians and access management um, with existing, you know, businesses and, and, and properties there is, you know, medians do, you know, control access and they restrict access. So we would want to work in concert with a lot of the businesses along 32nd Street who, who may be impacted by that um, to make sure that whatever we're planning is something that it can work out with them and it's not going to create, um, you know, issues for them. But I think as, as we see developments, as developments allow us to, because not all development, redevelopment work happens, that we can ask for things like um, um, roadway improvements and median improvements in front of, um, you know, businesses. It usually has to go through some kind of rezoning and things like that. Um, but just straight redevelopment doesn't always kick in the ability for us to require those developers to do things like median improvements or access control. Um, so, but that's something we will take back and, um, and work as much as we can 
Um, and that's going to be part of this project is working with businesses to uh, coordinate access um, to uh, meet the, the needs of the project, but also the needs of the businesses. Um, we've got quite a few questions in the chat box, so we'll try and do a lightning round. Um, there is a question about are we taking the probable water shortages facing the state into consideration with regard to the planned landscaping? I'll uh, try to see if I can uh, answer that. Um, with respect to planting, uh, the available plants that we are going to be using, we would propose to use, uh, come straight from the water department's uh, plant palette. And I'm pretty sure the water department is uh, sensitive to use, utilizing drought, to drought, drought tolerant planting. Um, and I, I don't want to put Aaron on the spot, but since he is a, a registered landscape architect, he might have a little more background on uh, the type of plants that uh, uh, would be considered to be planting in the street as far as uh, and how well they are easily maintained. Yeah, John, <clears throat> so in this corridor, we would definitely, um, there's gonna be two, two, actually three different plant lists that are gonna dictate what's allowed in the corridor. Um, the overhead power company has a plant list that they allow for planting underneath their power lines, um, which most of those are all desert adapted plants. Um, there is the Arizona Department of Water Resources has an approved plant list for anything that's planted within public right of way. And those all have to be uh, low water use, drought tolerant, desert adapted plants. And then as John, as you mentioned, uh, anything that's planted adjacent to some of the city of Phoenix water and sewer lines, those are on a separate um, approved list as well. So we kind of set up this matrix of the three different uh, restrictions and try to find what matches across all three. And that's gonna end up kind of really driving any plant material that would be introduced in this corridor. Thank you, Aaron. We are coming up on seven o'clock. So I wanna be mindful of everyone's time, but if we can go a little bit over, um, we'll try to get to a few more questions. Um, there is, there are a couple of questions having to do with the water line project and um, the fact that they are indeed two separate projects, but a couple of people have asked if there is any way to coordinate to the two product projects so that they happen on a tighter time frame. Does anybody want to take that? Um, I've been, in, uh, this is John, I've been in uh, cons consultation with the project manager for the water uh, pipeline project, as well as our uh, street maintenance uh, folks that are in charge of providing uh, street surfacing projects. And uh, we're planning on having a, uh, a powwow in the next couple of weeks, uh, realizing that the project timelines are starting to line up in such a fashion that we could plan for uh, uh, what would look, appear to be a seamless uh, construction project where the uh, water pipeline project would be finishing up and we could come back in hopefully uh, soon thereafter, uh, again, subject to identifying the, the uh, appropriate funding source. Uh, that would be the goal uh, to, when this project were, if it were available, Funding wise to be done uh, once we were out, we would be out. Uh, that, that's the goal in any real construction project. We don't, we don't ever endeavor to come in and uh, tear up a street, patch it up, walk away, come back and uh, fix the street and come back and patch it up. Uh, it, it would, if we can help it, we will try to make it one, look like one seamless project, uh, whether or not that is to us internally, uh, it, it may not be, but uh, that is our goal. Thank you, John. Um, another question was, do we have any traffic studies um, regarding the traffic that crosses 32nd Street? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm not aware of what exactly the database has in there, but I, I can imagine that 
uh, we do have, you know, we publish traffic volume maps that show the current data uh, of the volumes of traffic out there. I'm pretty sure our traffic services division that maintains that data has quite a bit of history as well as the crash data that I talked about. Uh, they probably, they also maintain um, pedestrian ridership. So yes, all of those uh, factors will be examined uh, cross streets, including uh, Choya, um, possibly Desert Cove will also be factored into that as well as the um, major intersection that's Shea and 32nd Street. Let me go to one new raised hand. Um, and again, we're coming up on the end of this meeting. So David Rudoy, if you could be brief in your remarks and definitely we encourage everyone, please, please, please use the survey. We'll pop that information up here in a minute. David? David Rudoy, are you there? Okay, we'll move on. Um, this is a question I don't know that we have this data to answer tonight, um, but there was a question about the number of pedestrian related accidents that have occurred near 32nd Street and Shea. Uh, quote, I'm concerned if we put a lovely median with shade and plants, some people experiencing homelessness might camp there, increasing the risk for accidents. So, um, yeah, I'll kind of weigh in there. I, I, I'll have to check some of our city code and ordinances related to this, but I, I, I know I'm not aware of any places where we've actually had people camping in medians. Um, because those are in the middle of the right of way and traffic areas. And there is some um, language about um, not stopping or, or, you know, loitering in medians. Um, and I, I, but that's something we can check on and look at it. But, um, you know, we typically don't have, um, you know, campment issues or, or sleeping homelessness issues in medians. It's usually, you know, in other areas um, outside of, you know, the traffic lanes. Um, there is a question, uh, we always get this question on these major projects. Is there an opportunity to underground the utility lines along 32nd Street? John, we knew we would get that question. That, that is uh, literally the million dollar question. Um, I, don't, I don't think the scope of this project has embraced the uh, could afford to embrace the cost to underground those large poles. Those poles carry our uh, transmission main. They carry a large amount of uh, electricity to distribute to the various parts of the city. So uh, it would be very costly to underground those uh, power lines. Um, and you've just exceeded my uh, ability to uh, get any more technical than that, but I understand that uh, they are very expensive to put underground. Um, we have a couple of comments in support of public art. And just so everybody knows who's on the line, we absolutely do plan to capture everything that's in the comment boxes and share that with the project team so that all your input is captured. And again, the survey is really important also for capturing that. Um, so. Um, we did have a question about if I understand correctly, the city will purchase and plant trees, but the homeowner will, will be responsible for tree maintenance. Tree maintenance, what if the homeowner um, is unable to provide maintenance? Will they be fined? How does the homeowner have the option to opt out? And I think that goes to the, the public tree planting project as opposed to something that's different from the median project and the um, the areas where you've proposed landscaping that's not on private property. Would you like to address that question? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, so I'll, I'll, historically the city, um, you know, they're, they're, if you didn't know that it, we maintain landscaping on our major streets um, and usually um, you know, if you're looking at some of the newer developments where you have homeowners associations and things like that, the landscaping is maintained by those organizations, those groups. Um, separate and apart from that, 
outside of those major streets, like an arterial street, um, there's usually a requirement for, or wait, there's a you know, city code re requirement for property owners to maintain landscaping um, within the right of way um, in front of their properties. And so, you know, as we look at more um, as this tree and shade uh, canopy coverage, uh, um, you know, effort that the city is underway taking right now is moving forward and, and, and continuing forward. One of the concerns is where, um, you know, where where this these tree and sh trees get planted later on. You know, who ends up ultimately maintaining them? So that's something we're we're um, grappling with and working with different, um, you know, homeowner groups and, and neighborhood groups and property owner groups when we're looking at some projects like this. And so um, we may not have an answer to your question right now uh, about who maintains it and, and if they don't maintain it, how we deal with that. But that's something we would want to work with. Um, the neighborhoods and the property owners as we look at opportunities to do these kind of public private partnerships with with, with tree planting. Thank you, Keeney. Um, I do have um, a couple of comments again related to the trees and yes, they would be low water usage drought tolerant trees um, approved by our um, city water department. Um, there is a question about whether this project would increase the property taxes in their zip code. Uh, I'm not aware of a way that we would do that. Um, you know, the property taxes, you know, are are set by, um, you know, property values. I mean, are, are the assessments of that are set by the county, or, or you know, um, I should say, are are assessed by the county. Um, there's nothing we're planning on doing with this project that would separately assess the property owners for the cost of the project or anything like that. So nothing, there's no plan of anything like that that would impact property taxes. And then a question regarding residential properties. Will you be taking residential property interests into consideration? Um, or will you be taking any property away from residential properties? And I, I think you addressed that, but um, in your previous remarks about right of way, but if you'd like to recap that and just reassure the public um, of our intent here to beautify their corridor. I, I'm going to uh, try to reiterate what uh, Kenny put out there uh, previously, and it's not our intent to burden anybody uh, with extra expense. Uh, we don't anticipate the, the goal of this project is to try to work within the existing right of way that that exists out there already. Uh, I don't know that we there's no intent on our part to expand the right of way for sure, um, and we're trying to utilize. The existing right away and the, the space in between those uh, two lines, so to speak, so that we can uh, one provide the, the the capacity the street needs to have, but two also provide the uh, beautification and upgrades to pedestrian safety and bicycle safety, and uh, make it look better. So uh, the goal is not to take we're not out to take anybody's land away from them. We're, we're trying to make it look better and the goal is to stay within the lines so to speak and uh, utilize what we have what we already have and maybe this is a this is a might be a good note to end on um, we had a comment uh, and again we, I, I can't reiterate enough we will definitely be sharing all the comments in the chat box with the project team, uh, but we had a comment from one uh, lady who said, please don't ever change this format. I would have not been able to be a part of this meeting if it were live. Really appreciate all the meeting and all the information. And all I would say from, uh, from the host perspective is we are here because of you and because we want to work with you. Um, so please definitely provide your feedback to us. Um, Kimi, do you have any closing remarks? Um, that you'd like to offer? Uh, I, I just want to reiterate the thank you for being here. Um, we're glad that this um, meeting format works for you. We know that um, you know, not everybody can make it to a community center or a public meeting location. So apart from the pandemic and, and the public health situation, I think the ability to connect with people and whether they're driving safely, hands-free, um, 
or, or you know, in their, their homes making dinner or whatever it might be, to be, to be able to connect and, and hear about what we're doing and be able to provide your input, I think is fantastic. And, and I, I love the fact that technology is able to help us do this. And so I hope it's, it is um, engaging more people rather than um, a detractor. Um, but again, this project is important to us. We want to hear your input, your feedback. So please uh, don't be shy about that. Uh, we want to make this project uh, work well. And uh, as, as uh, the councilwoman said, um, and, and I'll reiterate, uh, even though it may not budget be budgeted today, we will. We are committed to finding funding for this and to get this project funded and get it executed as quickly as we can um, after the water project has, <laughs> has gotten through. Um, we, we don't want to be on top of them. So thank you. With that, I'll just remind you, um, my colleague did type it into the chat box, letting you all know that our survey will close on June 7th. We invite you to please um, share that uh, website link um, and share the survey with your friends and neighbors. Um, if you did happen to have the website open earlier, uh, you may need to refresh the website. The survey was loaded during this public meeting. Um, so we do plan to come back and talk with you again sometime this fall after we synthesize all of your input and put it together. So again, thank you for participating and I'm going to go ahead and end this meeting um, and invite you to complete those surveys. Um, at the end of the meeting, you will get a, a survey from WebEx. Um, that does not deliver any feedback to us. That's a, a technology survey by the hosting company. So the project survey will be on the city website. So thanks again. Have a good night.